Hi. So now we're moving and look at uh, the dynamics of Ray Breakthrough System when uh, the uh, prey is logistical. Uh, so in this case, we have the dynamic of the prey without uh, predation is described by the classic logistic equation that you can see is reformed here. Okay, so R is the intrinsic growth rate and K is the current capacity. Then we do have the prediction term, uh, which you assume for simplicity to be proportional to the number of, uh, uh, you know, the praise uh, and uh, the goodness of predator through Q, which is the prediction coefficient. We know that our prey, as is described here, uh, it decreases exponentially with the mortality rate equal to mu in the absence uh, of uh, the prey, uh, but uh, the successful attack uh, of prey basically allow to increase the number of predators. And uh, the terms Q and P, which is the number of prey that are successfully attacked uh, by the predator, transform into new predator with an ecological rate of equal to E. So it needs to be properly calibrated if N and P are abundances or densities. If N or P are density expressed not in numbers but in biomass, then E is a, basically an ecological efficiency uh, whose value is typically set uh, around you know 10% or less, you know, considering also that you know uh, the survivals of the youngs uh, into the adult population. If we take this model and there are the R script uh, on uh, our website and we simulate through time spanning from a specific initial conditions, as you can see here, you get the population, you know, oscillate. This is the prey that oscillates and eventually level off. So we get these damper oscillations here of the prey as well as damper oscillation of the predator. These are reported on the same scale, so they look much smaller than that. And eventually we see that prey goes to long-term equilibrium point, it is about equal to 200, as well and, and the predator goes uh, to in the long-term to that equilibrium, which is about uh, 40 individuals. We've seen in the previous case, uh, the prey predator locked up Terra model for a Malthusian growth, that we get slightly different solutions if we start with different initial conditions. Is this the case also for a logistic prey? Well, we can run more simulation with the script and we see that while the actual shape and the amplitude of these cycles might be slightly different depending upon the initial condition, in the long run, uh, the uh, populations uh, will tend to the same equilibrium that we saw here in the upper panel, okay? Uh, the amplitude might be different, but the period of oscillation remain roughly the same. Okay, so it's very well ingrained in the mechanism of you know the population dynamics of this model. Uh, we can see here the solution of uh, the prey predator uh, model with the logistic growth. One interesting aspect with respect to uh, the case that we saw before is that when we compute the isocline of the prey, the non-trivial isocline of the prey, rather than having there being a straight horizontal lines, is a straight lines with negative slope. The intersect actually the horizontal axis for a density of the prey that is equal to k. The basically predator free carrying capacity would be what you know the density at which the prey would go if there were no predators. But uh, if uh, the efficiency of predation and the ecological efficiency are high enough, there is another non-trivial uh, intersection between the red isocline of the predator and the green isocline of the prey, which is the equilibrium coexistence there. The trivial equilibrium here still remain it's a saddle basically, so it's an attractor from the predator point of view, but you know, if we in, you know, have no predators and only if you prey, the prey will tend to grow up to their carrying capacity. And uh, when there are both prey and predator, you see that the model represents these damper oscillations 
and we spiraling down to the coexistent equilibrium. Okay, so this is what we get from this model. The second step we're moving forward here is uh, the prey predator dynamics, uh, you know, for a prey with logistic growth and functional response, response of the predator. The functional response represents the number of prey that are consumed by a single predator per unit time, okay? And uh, this number of prey that are consumed by a predator per unit time is not a linear function of the number of prey as it was in the previous model, but is a non-linear function of the density of the prey population, okay? That means basically that when uh, the density are actually very low here, it's some differences, you know, there is sort of a linear increase if they starting from really low density, if the density of the prey double, the consumed by the predator double as well. There are some differences, we're gonna see them now there, but a really high density on the other end all these different curves, basically, the number of prey consumed by the predator uh, level off to a constant number per unit time, okay, uh, which corresponding to the handling rate, you know, how many prey, given an enormous prey abundance, the predator is able to consume. The functional response has been classified about 70 years ago by um, um, Holling and uh, um, the uh, published seminal papers uh, and uh, it's classifying the functional response in these three main categories that are represented here. Okay, so functional response can be of type one, type two or type three. In the case of type one, uh, the relationship between number of prey consumed and density of prey in the population is linear up to some point where it level up quite abruptly, just there. And this is a typical functional response of uh, uh, filtrating organs like muscles and clings, for instance. Type two functional response on the other end uh, is probably one of the most common type of functional response it's linear, you know, only around the origin, but otherwise it's smoothly level off to an asymptotic level that is the handling rate, the number of prey that it consumes when the abundance of prey is really high. The functional response number three, type three functional response, is a, a function that increases and accelerates the number of prey consumed at a low density. At some point, while the concavity changes, and so there is an inflection point here and become, uh, you know, downward at really high density. So a really high density two and three are pretty similar among each other, but a low density, there is this big difference in which basically the prediction rate, you know, increase faster um, in a type three factor response while keep decreasing in a type two factor response. Uh, the type three functional response is typical, for instance, when the prey are so rare that the predator basically is uh, uh, you know, not focusing on the prey, either because it's not really worth, just they're so sparse, it becomes so difficult to prey them that it's not worth the investment of the energy, or simply sometimes because they are not used to, they do not recognize maybe a cryptic, uh, you know, prey. And so the more prey are present, the more used they become to prey the prey, the more efficient they become. While a really high density at some point, what really is matters is a satiation, right? The fact that, uh, you know, there are so many prey that the predator does not really have to spend a lot of time to catch them. Uh, but, you know, it encounter the prey quite frequently and the time that is spent is actually to process, it is to ingest the prey and to digest it. And this really becomes a limiting factor, okay? That is explain why there is this 
horizontal asymptote and the fact that the number of trades per unit time consumed by a single predator cannot increase forever, but it needs to level off at some point. That's as much as it can process in one day or whatever time interval makes sense for the specific order. Let's see how do we account for that into our equation. This is represented here in this model in which the new element here is this function that is a nonlinear function of n, right? And in fact, you can see how it is represented you know, here. And here you can see we have three density on the horizontal axis, okay? And this function as we described there, Q is this still you know, the prediction coefficient, and H in this case is the handling rate, is the number of prey successfully attacked and concealed by a single predator per unit time. And as you see, I have represented that, you know, in a way that H is, uh, you know, the asymptote, the horizontal asymptote of this function, and the Q is the prediction rate, okay? So the question, of course, here is, uh, you know, what are the implications of including a, you know, in this case, a type two function of response? So let's look at that. And we ran some simulation first with the script that are available on the website. And what you can see here, we start with some initial condition. There are oscillations. Actually, you know, probably you should actually run this, you know, uh, for a longer time. And you will see that these oscillations dump down at the beginning, but they don't, you know, they don't dump off. They continue and they level to a fairly stable uh, cycles, both in terms of period, a fixed period and amplitude, okay? And if we start with different initial conditions, in this case, we see that this, um, you know, oscillation increase in amplitude, but they ended up to go back to the same period of oscillation and the same amplitude, okay? That in this case, for instance, uh, is uh, basically slightly above, you know, um, 700, okay? So in the long run, and this is the, our take on, is that the predator uh, uh, prey system exhibits long-term sustainer stable oscillation that regards the initial conditions, at least so long as the, you know, num initial number of prey and predators is larger than zero. You know, and those oscillations will be characterized for that set of model parameter by a very specific period of oscillations at a very specific amplitude. This is well represented, as you can see here, in fact, uh, into this phase diagram in which we have again the prey on the horizontal axis, the predator on the vertical axis, the isocline of uh, the predator, and the interesting things, as you see, that introduction of type two functional response you know, make the non-trivial isocline of the prey as a parabolic function of n, okay? So this is a parabolic function that again intersect the horizontal axis in non-trivial solution k here, which is the carrying capacity in the absence of the predator, okay? And the interesting thing is can we prove uh, formally and analytically that if this intersection occurred to the left of the half of this parabolic function, this equilibrium point is unstable, it's not stable any longer, and the stable solution is a limit cycle of specific period and specific amplitude, okay? So limit cycles are similar potentially to those type of cycles that uh, Umberto D'Ancona and Vita Volterra observe uh, at the beginning of the past centuries can still be produced by a classic Lotta Volterra model by introducing the functional response uh, of the predator. And the fact that predator, when there are lots of preys, it's not you know, as efficient as it could be if the relationship were linear, it's not linear, it saturates because of association. And so the prey can temporarily escape from uh, predation you know, before the predator slowly grow up uh, you know, in number, in abundance or in density. And this is typical uh, happening because as we mentioned in uh, the beginning of this lecture, generally with a lot of notable exceptions in social predations and some other cases, but the predator is a bigger body size than the prey, similar or bigger, uh, you know, by and large, and uh, uh, which 
uh, basically implies that all the life histories happen on a clock that for the predators lower than for the prey, so it takes longer to grow up in abundance than usually its prey state. A lot of variation of the theme for uh, the uh, you know uh, prey predator model. Uh, like for instance here, we can see what is the dynamic of uh, a generalist predator for a constant uh, density, sorry, a generous predator with the, as a constant density P. So we do not describe any longer the dynamic of the predator. We describe only the dynamic of the prey, which is a logistic dynamics in the instance of predator with a, a type two functional response for the predator. So this is basically our model, okay? It's basically only the first equation where P is constant. And constant means your generous predator as a wide diet, okay, a wide range of resources. And so it does not really matter whether the density of N1 here, our praise is high or low, their abundance is actually, you know, fairly constant in time. So, you know, the uh, curve that I represented here represent the, you know, parabolic logistic term here that we have learned you know, in the previous classes. And basically it's the rate of change of the population without predation. And then we had to add this term there. And this term is an increasing stability function, as we know, of the prey density here. Here on the horizontal axis, we have the number of preys, n1. And so uh, for small n1, its mean is uh, linearly proportional with uh, you know, with a slope Q and for large N, it level off, uh, you know, to an asymptote and P is constant. And so in this specific case, you know, this would be the, uh, you know, the, the uh, function that describe the, uh, you know, the uh, right and terms that is represented here. So this is the function. And, and this is a minus, it's a loss term due to predation. So the rate of change of the population is going to be given by the difference between the blue curve, which is the recruitment rate per unit time, minus the predation rate. And so what we see that if there is predators at the density P1, the intersections between these two curves is now here. It's not down there any longer. So what we actually see is that we got a new equilibrium density. Okay, and this equilibrium density occurs because if the population drops below n plus one, the recruitment rate is going to be larger than the prediction rate, and so the population will tend to increase and go back to n plus one. But if for any perturbation we ended up to having more than n plus one in the middle, then the prediction rate on average will be larger than the recruitment rate because recruitment drops because of density dependent dynamics, and so the population will tend to decrease to n plus one. So n plus one is going to be the new attractor, the new equilibrium point of the population. If for any reason the number of predators increases and becomes P2, well, we're going to get a new equilibrium point, uh, a new density, which is actually lower than it was before. And if uh, the predator density is even larger, I would say it's a speed free we're going to get a, a, you know, a new equilibrium point, which is going to be here. But the interesting thing is because of the curvature of the functional response, we're going to get actually another intersection here for M3 minus, right? And then, of course, we always have the origin. And this is relevant because if for any reason the population density drops below M3 minus, then the prediction rate is going to be larger than the recruitment rate. That means that this difference here is going to be negative and the rate of change of the population is going to be negative. That means the population will tend to decrease even further. And uh, this basically translates with the fact that we can see here is that like for instance, in this specific case, you know, we have that our uh, recruitment, you know, per unit time function rather than being a parabolic function with all concavity being downward, as this initial part where concavity is upward, and we have learned to refer to this, uh, you know, phenomenon, this depensation as depensation or Ali effect. Okay, so and it's very important because the Ali effect might be produced also by excessive predation. Okay, uh, and not only by reproductive failure as we have seen in the previous part of the course. 
And in the case of the orange curve like there, you know, we have a critical differentiation. That means that the population drops below N minus three, like if, you know, if there is a really bad ER or excessive exploitation, then the population won't be able to, re, you know, to recover any longer and will be doomed to local extinction to the other measures are taken. So the important things here is that a generalist predator uh, with a constant density P uh, and a factional response of type two, like in this case, you know, might basically give rise to this uh, depensation or critical depensations uh, that are referred to in ecology as only effect. Other variation on the theme are like, you know, if we want to describe a type three functional response, you can see that here and say, you know, like you can describe this and we could derive in fact a mechanistic reason why that is the case here. We are simply saying that the attack rate is proportional to the density of the individuals. When you do this all together and you account for association, you derive a curve of this type. So n squared, that means for really low n values, prey density, the initial uh, increase of the you know, number of prey eaten for unit time is actually uh, like a square function and then you know, you reach an inflection point and then you level off because of saturation. Okay. Another example that is reported here is like what well, you have two predators that are exploiting the same prey. So in this case, we simply account for the functional response and the prediction terms for these two predators. And of course, the even more general case in when we have uh, a range of praise, and this is n praise, so we have uh, n equations that, you know, look very similar, and let's assume we have two predators, and so for each of them, we need to account the prediction from predator A and predator B, uh, along with their, you know, uh, prediction rate and handling rate for both predator A and predator B. And these terms here consider the dietary preferences basically of, uh, you know, in uh, the predator A and predator B. And, uh, you know, uh, and this basically is relevant and you see that, you know, they start to get much more complicated, but it's relevant because it's the transition from the simple to species model and this is the case to n plus two or n plus m, you can have several predators and several preys and maybe predator and preys at different tropic level. And uh, when this happened, basically we are transitioning from the classic, you know, uh, simple, you know, population dynamics of consumer resource into the full community or food web dynamics uh, uh, that is also becoming very important. So to summarize, you know, we have learned, I think, at least four article lessons here. The fact that predator can control a prey with an exponential growth when predator free. Uh, also, we can say that any prey population can support a, a predator population. Uh, the uh, formula for equilibrium abundance uh, give estimates of average abundance through time. So when we get sustained limit cycle, um, then uh, is uh, where, you know, that is the average, you know, density of prey and predators, but that are cycling through these phases of the faster, almost exponential growth, reaching a peak and then collapsing down, you know, with a time lag, usually the predator after uh, the prey. And also, I think it's important to recognize as uh, uh, Gancora basically observed uh, at this point a century ago that the predator prey systems have an inherent tendency to oscillate. And uh, this becomes very important when we think that this inherent tendency to oscillate of the system uh, compound with seasonal effect that also produce a strong force in function like a seasonality in reproductions and in uh, mortality that uh, might, as I was mentioning, you know, compound and uh, give rise to a resonance phenomenon for which they then this ups and down the boost uh, and boom, you know, uh, and, you know, dramatic collapse becoming even much bigger because of this multiple effect.
And with this, we have covered basically, you know, the introductory aspect of pre predictor dynamics. So thank you very much for your attention.